Hi, I'm Nancy Peckinger, and I guess you've just heard a lot about me. It's not only half of it's true, and you can figure out which half. Um, so the idea tonight <coughs> is that we're going we're to be talking about the solo performance, and I'm going to ask them questions, uh, some groups of questions, um, <coughs> for them to, to talk to each other about. So I'm kind of here in your stead for a while to ask questions that I think you might like to ask, and actually I just looked at the questions and I think <coughs> actually most of them are covered. Um, but I thought first, before we started, I wanted to, um, did I do that? Sure. <laughs> this is water. Um, you've read all about these people. We've got, and, and, and what I thought is, you've read about them, you know all the things that they're doing. I wanted them to introduce themselves tonight, and I want them to do it, I ask them to do it in a particular way, which is <clears throat> that often the stories that you tell at home, the anecdotes which, um, you know, people tell on you or, um, you, or that make people cry with laughter um, in a family situation, they're probably the first stories of our lives and the first time maybe there's even a kind of a performative Quality to, quality to it, and it tells you a lot about the person and a lot about um, their family and their lives. So I thought, I asked them each to make, tell us a, a little short, little five minute or so, or shorter, <laughs> Joel, um, about themselves. So they will introduce, and we'll start with Ben. Oh, okay. Um, oh, yeah, I think we should make Joel go first, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I actually do feel a little out of place because I'm not a solo performer. Um, you uh, may be read, I, I'm a director um, so who just worked on a solo performance piece. Um, so I guess as like the odd man out here, I mean, when I started thinking about anecdotes that you asked, I went back to what are those stories. Um, and there's several, and they all kind of were around one theme um, of that I just watch things. Um, when I was a child, even just like basically an infant, um, I was sitting at the table with my uh, older brother, who's four years older than I am, um, and his best friend at the time, who's a little girl named Jordana, and my mom, and Jordana sat there and she was staring at me and staring at me and staring at me, and she finally looked over to my mom and said, is he real? <laughs> and, and I was that baby, and that's the those are the stories that are told about me. My mom took me to college and finished her college degrees with me as an infant. Um, she, she, you know, I, uh, she famously tells the story uh, that I um, laid underneath my blankie um, and animated the characters and gave them things to say to each other. Um, so I was directing the, you know, farm animals on my blanket as a, at a young age. Um, and uh, I guess there's probably one last, I mean, to go there, embarrassing story. Um, as a, you know, three or four year old, I had an incident at the grocery store with my mother uh, where I was sitting in the, in the carriage facing her and we were lined up um, to check out. Um, and I was looking at the woman next to my mother and looking at my mother and looking at the woman next to my mother and looked back at my mother and at, at you know, a loud uh, voice said to my mom, Mom, how come this lady's are so large and yours are so small? Um, <laughs> And so I guess th that, you know, began a process of observing um, <laughs> and pointing things out that should be obvious to everyone. Um, so, you know, that, you know, those are the stories that are told about me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um... Let's see. Well, my name is Mo Angelos, and um, I am just a recent convert to solo performance, uh, actually. So thank you for having me. Um, 
okay, I'll tell a story about the theater. When I was a, when I was a little girl, um, my parents uh, were, they started their family late, and my mother was especially fond of musical theater. And so we had a lot of cast albums, and this was the soundtrack of my childhood. You know, Rodgers and Hammerstein, like really, she loved the, you know, the hits, right? And um, I was very obsessed as a child with South Pacific and sang it all the time. Um, my mother thought that was, that was great. I don't know that the rest of the family did. But, um, and there was a revival at Lincoln Center um, in, I think, 67 or 68. Florence Henderson played Nellie Forbush. And, m OK. <laughs> The song, I'm Gonna Wash That Man Right Out of My Hair, was like, I, I, I couldn't quite, I was like, what is that, how, how does this work? What is, you know? And my mother explained to me that yes, she washes her hair on stage. And I was just like, really, mom? Really, really, she's gonna wash her hair on stage? And this was like, you know, I could not imagine how this was gonna take place. And then the show, you know, we came to New York to see the show, and it, you know, I was just beside myself with excitement. I was probably seven years old. And um, <laughs> the nurses came out, and, you know, the song starts, and they formed a sort of human shower curtain. And she washed her hair. And I was just like, okay, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> I don't understand this at all. I mean, I kind of did, but, like, it was really, it felt very avant-garde to me. <laughs> And so I think that um, the idea that people could be a shower curtain um, really affected me very deeply. Um, and, uh, you know, I still to this day love that musical, and I was actually in that musical in college, directed by Ann Bogart, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so that's, I guess that's my anecdote. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Huntkin. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind when I read that w wasn't something that my family talked about me, but my friends have. They even wrote a song about this story about me, which they like to sing to me to embarrass me. But I was, it was about six years ago, and I was in London with Reverend Billy and the Church of Stop Shopping, and we were performing at this, this anarchist squat with the space hijackers. And this really amazing people that do crazy, crazy things, even bought a tank. Um, so, so we'd just done this show for them, you know, this really crazy high-energy show, and, and we decided to run out into the streets, and um, we jumped into, I, I guess they're like locks that are in, in London there, you know, the, right? Yeah, thank you, you're nodding. <laughs> so we, we all, you know, and it was cold, and, but we all jumped into the lock as young people are wont to do, and... Um, and, um, you know, most, mostly people were naked. And everyone jumped in, like, oh, that's great, it's freezing, and jumped out. But I stayed around for a while, and really, I love the cold, freezing water sometimes. And I uh, used to do the polar bear club in Coney Island. And, yeah, it's fun. It's good for your health. So then, um, so I stayed in, and I was swimming around, and there was this gorgeous swan that came up to me. And it was just so pristine in the moonlight. And the swan and I sort of started to do this little dance together, like moving back and forth. And I really felt like we were romancing each other. And it was just gorgeous. And then I saw it had this um, little island, you know, with a little house on it. I was like, oh, it would be so great. I'll just go and lie out on the swan island. And we'll sit there and look at the moon together. And, and I start, as soon as I started to head in that direction of its island, the swan reared its, its wings up and hissed and became like this cobra. It was like <laughs> and, and it started to chase after me and, and try to bite me. And, and I was swimming, and I'm not a very good swimmer, and I was swimming as fast as I could, and, and all the, the, the space hijackers were on the side, like, don't kill the swan, Monica, it's the queen's bird. And, and I was like, <laughs> trying to not hurt the bird, but not, you know, kicking it so it wouldn't bite me and, and swimming in f as far as I could into the darkness in the lock naked. And I made it to the other side and climbed up this ladder, looking all the way across the lock where my clothes were, <laughs> and, then, and no, seeing no way to get around to the other side. So, and the swan down below, <laughs> seeing it be looking up. <laughs> 
And so we're like, well, there's no way around this. So I'm just going to have to jump back in. So I jumped back in, swam all the way across, rejoined my friends, and, and, and suddenly felt all of this anger rush up in me and, and got really absurd and started to yell at the swan. And I was like, fuck you, swan, I'm from America. And, and <laughs> I'm sorry to swear. But <laughs> and they, and my friends had to drag me away, yelling and wet into the darkness of London. That's my story. <laughs> I wanted to hear the song that her friends wrote about that story. You're not going to sing it. They just, it just, I'm, it's. I have to swear again to say that it's just like crazy fucking swan, crazy fucking swan, go back to the lock where you belong. Something like that. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I'm Joel De La Fuente. And um, I remember uh, we were backstage talking about stories that your family tell about you. And I, I kind of was thinking about the stories I had in my head about my family, um, which so often can be the wrong stories. Um, because I remember when I was a kid, uh, I just... I loved going to the theater. I just remember that. I remember like I, I would love when there were field trips or when my folks would take us and there was just something about sitting in the audience and then that hush that comes right before the lights come down and just that feeling of, of magic that I would feel. And uh, it was just one of my favorite things to do. I never thought to myself, oh, let's go to the theater. Let's I would just forget about it until we were going again and then I would just be so excited to be in that position. And um, so, you know, that was as a boy, and then when I was in grade school and stuff, I, people would do, you know, they did theater at my school, and it, I never saw anybody that looked like me on stage, so I just never thought that that was a possibility. So this, this love that I had for the theater, I just didn't think that that was possible, but I wanted to be around the theater, so um, I did stage crew, and um, I did it for, you know, for a number of years, uh, you know, through like middle school and stuff, and then finally they said, uh, well, you know, there's nothing left for you to do. You should actually be in a play. <laughs> and uh, I was excited and terrified at the same time because I felt, you know, I was also one of very few Asian American um, students in the school. And I, al I already kind of thought that I was um, playing a part to begin with. So I kind of thought, well, what's it going to be like if I'm up on stage <laughs> playing another part? No one's ever going to believe me. It's going to be humiliating. Um, but so I did it. And... Uh, there was no looking back after that. I just, I, you know, it was, it's, it's what I love to do. And, and so I did it all through high school and then I went to college and then the idea was, and then again, just the, this kind of preconceived notion that um, I just always kind of thought I was going to be a doctor. So, you know that feeling. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I showed up and maybe, maybe I'll do theater later, but, but for now I just have to, you know, I got to, I got to do the right thing and start getting real about stuff. But then, of course, I fell in love with theater right away, and it was all about theater. And then there was this conversation I was supposed to have with my parents when it was time to declare my major, and I was theater major all the way, and I don't think I could have majored in anything else because all my classes were theater classes. And, um, and I remember just thinking about that situation that they were very supportive, they were surprisingly so, except I always felt like my father wasn't, um, he wasn't really, like that was my story. Like he. He, he didn't get angry, and he said, I, you know, and my, my mother said straight up, she said, you know, I, our, our dream was for you to have an education and to do whatever it is that you want to do, and we're just so happy that you found something you love to do. And I thought, well, that's, my parents are the best, but then I thought, my dad didn't really say that. <laughs> my dad is actually really quiet about it. And all he said was, well, um, can you study acting? Um, <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I think actually I really want to go to grad school and study acting. And he said, so you get a master's in acting? And I said, yeah. And he was thrilled with that idea because, you know, you could teach. <laughs> if things didn't work out, you could teach. And so I kind of thought, you know, he doesn't really accept what I do. And I, it, it kind of hurt me a little bit, you know. And, and so one day I was back home, and I'm from Chicago, and I was getting my teeth cleaned because... Um, it was free <laughs> in Chicago. So I was getting my teeth cleaned, and the dentist was telling me, as he was cleaning my teeth, every single show I did in, in college, you know, and uh, all the parts I played, and this must have been great, and that must have been great. And I was astonished, and I said, you know, 
I had this little thing in my mouth, so you know, I was like, how do you know what I, how do you know all that? And he said, oh, your father tells me. Your father knows every single thing you've ever done. And yeah, I, I, so I cried, you know? <laughs> I was, in the, I was in the chair, and I, I remember I like had tears coming down my face, just thinking, you know, because it was one of those situations where I, I was so sure I was the expert on the story about my father and his relationship to what I did. And as it turned out, I, I couldn't have been more wrong. And in fact, he, he felt like what I had hoped, what I dreamed that he would feel, but I had missed it all along. So that was a great lesson for me, in addition to just being a tremendous blessing to have, you know, my parents support me in what I do, but but I, I just always remember that because I thought um, I felt like I I was relearning my family, you know. So anyway, that's my story. Great, that was really interesting. I feel like I can know you better. Okay, so I have a question. I want to start with sort of a definitional phase because you've all um, well, I guess you haven't, but you've acted. <laughs> in yeah. plays and solo and with people. You play well with others, don't run with scissors. But the, what's the difference between just being a storyteller, uh, doing a solo performance? When you call it a solo performer, is that different from being like a one-woman play, like you just had, you just directed Anne? Um, is that a solo performance or is that a play? Or is, and, and let's just take a few minutes on that in case there are differences among all of these things. Mo? <laughs> Um, well, you don't have to. You, you look like you were. Or does it matter to define it? Well, I think that there are differences. Um, the, um, you know, a, a lot of times, um, solo pieces is is are are very straight up. You know like old-fashioned storytelling, you know? Like, um, did anybody see um, an Iliad at New York Theater Workshop with Dennis O'Hare? Yeah, I mean, or, or Steven Spinella, either one. I mean, that was like beautiful, just, you know, straight up storytelling in, in the, the Greek sense of, you know, this um, epic poem, uh, uh, reciting poetry, but telling a story. Uh, so that, is, that's kind of different from the show I did, um, <laughs> because I'm I well, I was to, I I was trying to tell a story with material that was not s d constructed to tell a story, right? So that was my task. Can you be more specific? Okay, so the play I did, uh, Sontag Reborn, was a theatrical adaptation of the journals and notebooks of Susan Sontag. Uh, the writer and cultural critic and uh, smart lady. Um, so that so she was not she she didn't you know <laughs> she was not trying to construct a play you know uh, that was my job to take these things and construct uh, tell a story make an arc I hope um, but to animate these journals you know that's how I thought about it like an animation of some kind. Um, but there are many ways to approach it, you know. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the thing that came into my mind when you asked that question was, I mean, it was actually, it was, it became very important to us on the Anne kind of producing side and everything that we did get it out there that it was a one woman play. Um, it was very important that it wasn't just seen as like you're gonna come see Anne talk and tell some stories again, because like you say, uh, you know, we were working really hard to sculpt an arc so that you did feel like you, by the end of the evening, had gotten more than you would have gotten had you just read a book about Anne or uh, seen a documentary about Anne Richards, um, that, that there was a reason that you had come to sit in a theater and see this performance. Um, and frequently, I, when I, talked about the show, I always reference the fact that Holland Taylor, when she set out to write the show, she had never done a solo show, um, but she'd done a lot of plays. So she actually, the only real reference she had for herself was, 
you know, in a play, this is what happens. And she sat down and wrote a really big play um, that then my kind of big task with her became editing it down and trying to sculpt it um, into an evening that everyone would enjoy and wouldn't have to come back, you know, tomorrow night. So, um, <laughs> so um, you know, and, and, and it was interesting that we had to kind of define it because we, there are so many different versions of what the solo performance might be. Um, but it was important to us that it was like, you knew you were going to get more than just like nice little stories about Anne, that there was something that would be enlightened upon leaving. Um, so you thought, and you thought of it as a play, not a... Definitely play. thought of it as a play, yes, for sure. Well, I was just thinking about, about when I went to, I went to Syria to Damascus, Syria. Um, I, I bicycled across the Middle East. The last play I just did at Culture Project was Blondie of Arabia, and it's my solo show about bicycling through the Middle East by myself. And I went into Damascus, Syria, and I saw... Wait, what year is this? This, this was a year before the, uh, the Arab Spring. Exactly a year before. And <laughs> so Damascus was beautiful then. It's one of the most beautiful places. Syria is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. The kindest people I've ever met in my life, anyway. But um, I saw who is supposedly the last storyteller in Syria, Abu Shadi. And he sets up in this cafe behind the giant mosque um, every, every day after the evening prayer, and he'll sit there and do storytelling. And the way I saw him and the way I saw this Indonesian storyteller I saw that I performed in a festival with in Greece, he told me about how he was working, um, he was being sort of an apprentice to a master storyteller in Indonesia who performed stories that went, I think, as long as nine days long. And he, at this point, was, could only do like three days long. So he was, you know, not so good yet. But, um, <laughs> and I see, sort of was thinking of him and thinking of Abu Shadi as more of vessels for stories. So in these other cultures and, and traditions in the world where they're really like ancient traditions of storytelling, these people sort of act more as, as vessels for these stories that are maybe epics, maybe things that, that morals and things that everyone knows in a way. And, it, and it, it's not so much about the storyteller, him or herself, even though how they execute it, of course, has to you know have its precision and its craft and its art. But it's much more about just continuing that, that tradition of the story and that oral tradition and hearing that. And so that's how I think about storytelling, at least, in a way. And, okay, so that's like Homer, you know, sitting there telling stories and sort of of the culture. But so that storytelling, do you think solo performance is different from that? Well, I... Or what you, what, what you do is that, or is it different? What I do is, is, um, is personal storytelling. So I'm not... I'm not accessing those deeper, those those you know, um, further back myths, but I'm sort of I'm telling my own myths and or that are true, but but I'm 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 just trying to stay pure on. I'm, I do think about it storytelling because I, it's very simple. Um, I do my shows um, carrying them. I tour around Europe on bicycle or to do these shows sometimes or around different countries. And so it has to be very simple what I have with me. You know, I just have everything I have on my bicycle and then I can set up and do it no matter if I'm doing it in a tent or I'm doing it outside or doing it wherever, that it's really just about, you know, it's, it's very much like poor theater and that it's just the essence of the story so that the audience has space to imagine and to go on that whole journey themselves. Okay. Good. Well, I I love that idea. I, you know, uh, similar to um, Holland, I had never done a one-person show before, and I, um, before I did uh, this play, uh, Hold These Truths, this last fall, and um, in so many ways, I think my uh, perception of the one-person show, as opposed to the one-person play or whatever, was was a little bit of an obstacle for me because, similar to my experience in high school, there was a distance between myself and the idea of it. I didn't see myself as being able to do a one-person show, or I didn't see myself as having an interest, you know, of being up on stage by myself telling a story. So when this project came along, which I did not write <clears throat> or direct, the, the, the appeal that this project had for me was 
I had never heard of the man that the story was about. And it shocked me that I'd never heard of him. And it was a beautiful story. And I felt that it was necessary to tell that story. And I felt that the opportunity for me to tell that story w was just too great to pass up. So, um, okay, so I'll tell that story. But then, so what do I know about the one person show? I had to just drop that right away. What do I know? What, what do I know? Well, I know how to do plays. I've done a lot of plays before. And so I approached it like that, which is that how do we, you know, how do you tell a story? It's just very, you know, just very simply. And what I came to understand about my work on this play was uh, it was just a, a simplified, purified version of what I aspire to do when I'm in a play, which is to tell a story, um, to serve a story, to serve it in front of an audience, um, and to share that experience. And, to, and, and whatever that shared, you know, I'm going to do my best to tell this story to you, but it's what happens between us that makes the event happen. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and, and for a one-person show, that's pretty much it in a nutshell, because uh, you were, it's just you, and it's just the audience, and, and it's very clear that that's what the situation is, you know, that I'm about to tell a story to you collectively, and then things are gonna happen between us. You know, and sometimes when you're doing a play, that can be, you can get away without noticing the audience or appearing to notice the audience. You can, you can share the experience with your, you, you know, your, your peers up on stage with you, and then you go backstage and commiserate about the audience and everything. But you don't, you don't have that here. It's just, it's literally like, it's, it's the challenge and the task is right in front of you, and that's what it is. And I think that, um, for me, it was so, um, just the challenge as an actor, to, to meet that challenge every night was so invigorating and pure. And then, on top of that, to get to tell the story that I was getting to tell was additionally invigorating. That, Can I just ask you something yeah. within that? Because there's a difference between, if you tell a story, you know, you're in charge of, you're, you're telling a story about something or whatnot. And then there's having a, a story being told through you where you're performing another identity, mm -hmm. right? They, I don't know if the story that you were telling, you were that person. Well, I, mean, I, like I think they're part of the same thing. I mean, I yeah. think the bottom line is you're, you're there to tell a story. And so you're serving a story. And then what is that story? In this particular case, it was about a real man, so I was playing the man. But then, you know, there were 36 other people to play. So... So I played those people too. And, but that whatever, whatever is necessary, whatever you have to do, you tell that story. You know, it's the same as in a play. It's just that you know, whatever is necessary sometimes is spread among, you know, there's four other actors. And then, you know, and in, in my case too, it's, it's you and then it's a designer and it's a director. It's very collaborative. It's not, you know, the one person show isn't just, you know, the actor. You know, it's, it, it is a collaboration and it's, it's the audience as well. Um, but again, the purity of it, the simplicity of it, it's, it's kind of like whittled down to its essence. It's what you have on your bicycle. You know, I love that. It's like what I can carry on my bike and, and hold these truths. It's, um, and, and it's current, like it's, uh, it's had a couple of different incarnations since uh, it started in, um, since we did it in the fall. But basically it's like a suitcase, which is similar to um, uh, uh, Dennis's piece. You know, he, I know he has a suitcase. It's, and, and three chairs. And so wherever we go, we can find three chairs. You know, uh, we can find three chairs, and I can just take my suitcase with me, and that's and 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 me, and you, and then we have a story. Um, and whatever by hook or by crook, you're going to tell that story. You know, whether you're embodying, you know, this man, and then you need to play the turtle. So who's going to be the turtle? Well, I'm going to be the turtle this way, you know, or I'm going to, you know, be uh, his wife this way, and you know. Hey, well, I want to skip one of the. Um, and let's we'll skip down to the, sort of the issues about story, okay? Um, and you, you said this is your first time doing it, but what, would, what draws you to this form of storytelling? Um, do, you, ha, do you mind autobi... I mean, here's, here's a bunch of questions, and you can each talk about them in different ways. Like, how do you know a story is the kind of material that would be good for a solo show instead of another kind? Do you start with a question? Um, what, you know, what's the impetus for for working on on the show? Do you do you generally mine biographical or autobiographical uh, details? 
you know, how much research do you go? But anyway, first, what captures you? What part of the, how do you know when the story is there? Do you, you're just walking along and it bang, you realize that's the story. So it happens to me with poetry, so I don't know, you know, but. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll tell kind of what became Holland's press piece about, you know, because that was the frequent question of, you know, why a one-person show about Ann Richards, and we all, all the time at Talkbacks, we got, why not make it into a movie, why not, uh, there's, you know, there's offstage voices in our show, so why don't we see those, but I had those same questions, too, when I came to the piece, and this, she sent me the script, and I was sitting there looking at it and reading it and going, okay, you know, like, why aren't we meeting Nancy, the offstage secretary? And, you know, what, you know, why don't I get, you know, a glimpse of Bob Bullock? And, you know, what is it that I, and for Holland, it became about, you know, she, she was really moved by the loss of Ann Richards in our world. Um, she didn't know why. Um, she, she didn't, she had met her once in her life and she, she felt like, well, you know, if I, I, why am I so distraught? I don't know what to do. And it was, she was driving in her car and she thought, well, I could play her. Um, and then she, she frequently says, I know people, I can get a movie made about her. But then she had the next step to say, uh, you know, actually there's no one more theatrical than this woman. Um, it is actually a play. Um, there's a great story about Ann Richards that, that um, we were told that at one point she was at a dinner party with um, other people at her table, happened to be Billy Crystal and Robin Williams, um, and somebody else that's also incredibly funny that I can't remember right now, but it was the first time in their lives they had not been the uh, funniest person in the room. Um, and and um, so there, you know, there kind of sets it up. It's like Ann Richards, she's there to entertain. That was, you know, we all remember uh, the 1988 DNC speech where she knocked it out of the park and became an a, you know international hit, and so there was an already kind of a, a you know larger than life personality that can hold your attention, and then again I came back to like the question of like yes but that doesn't mean I can't meet other people that are around her, um, but for Holland and then for me once I kept working on it it became about focusing in on the essence of her, not diffusing the evening, really feeling like um, you have spent an evening with Ann Richards where she was telling you a story at one moment and then you got to see her most private moments where she was sitting in her office working like a dog and then taking phone calls from her family and all of those kind of things where you already you just had enough of those other people and, but you were really getting to the essence of exactly who she was. Um, and that was why that form came to work for our play, I think, is it's like you, uh, so many people said, and actually Cecile Richards, her daughter, said about the show, she felt like she had two more hours with her mother. Um, and you, you don't get that in a film, um, you know, even like Lincoln, you know, was a brilliant film, um, but, you know, everything that Daniel Day-Lewis did up there was great and everything, but it was also a film and it was, you know, the war and the epic nature of it. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what worked for uh, us on Anne. So how about you? How, what got you into Susan Sontag, for instance? Well, I read those journals, you know, and they're amazing. They're amazing. Her mind was crazy. I mean, she was so incredibly intelligent and precocious from a very young age. And that was, um, fr you know, frightening to me, but <laughs> um, also very compelling. But there was something about the stories that she was telling, especially in the first volume of journals when she's very young, you know. She begins them, uh, the published versions begin when she's 14 years old. And she's telling stories about being a teenager, being a really super smart teenager, but still, she's a teenager. And, you know, she's, a, you know, she's dramatic like teenagers are. And, you know, that it sort of lends itself to, there, she's already telling stories in there, right? So there, there was that. And um, there's the, a journal to me uh, is, is like a conversation we have with ourselves, right? 
It's like I'm interrogating and talking to myself, basically, and leaving traces of that. Um, to go back and reread, which she did, actually. I don't. I can't bear to read whatever notebooks I have kept. But she was. <laughs> she went back and reread and annotated. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, in the margins, margins, right, you know, <laughs> comments to herself, which is how this, how the construct that uh, we use in the in the piece is that there's an older version of Sontag who's in video, who is sort of like peering down at her younger self that is played by me. Oh, well, that's me too, but in old lady, old lady makeup <laughs> and in video, you know, peering down at me, you know, furiously in my notebooks, right? But that, um, so, so there was that, but that the reason why I felt like it needed to be a piece of theater is that a journal is also, it, it is a conversation with oneself, but it is also a record of a life lived. And I felt like it needs to uh, be live, you know? Um, so that there is uh, a loop that happens between the audience and the performer that um, is happening right this very second, actually, um, that cannot be um, duplicated in any other form. And, um, that, and, and it's about the liveness. It's about us all here in this room right now being alive in this moment, right? And that is, um, you know, like the, the, the fantastical, mystical thing about performance to me. So. Well, um, so, but, but um, just. Probing a little further. Probe. Probe. Um, is I mean, I read some of her journals, but I didn't yes. think I needed to get up. Into, I mean, so I mean, the, the point that, because I'm not a performer. But no, but I mean, I, this must have spoken to you in some way sure. that you felt, because you've read lots of books and you didn't, you know, what, what about this really? Ugh. Did you just want to be Susan Sontag for two No, couple? God, no, please. The poor woman. <laughs> I mean, she was brilliant, and I think that that intelligence was a burden to her, you know? It was, it was a burden. Um, consciousness is a burden, <laughs> as she often said. <laughs> um, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I mean, there's this, okay, at the beginning of the show, I tell this story. She's 16 years old, and she's already been sort of like, kicked out of her high school. They just said, okay, we can't do anything else for you. Will you please go away? You know, I'm sure she was just like, you know, so incredibly intelligent and, you know, a totally annoying um, to everyone. <laughs> and so she goes to Cal. She gets into uh, University of California at Berkeley when she's 16 years old and she go, you know, she leaves home. She was living in Los Angeles uh, at that, at that point and she ends up in, um, in, uh, San Francisco, in Berkeley, and um, she meets a woman who says to her, the best people in San Francisco are at the bars. And they go on this bar crawl, right? This woman, Harriet H., as she's called in the, um, in the journals, takes her on a bar crawl um, uh, to, the, to, the, so, to the gay bars, right? So first they go to a drag show, and then they go to the dyke bar, and then they go to the gay bar, and then they're a little drunk, and they hold hands, and they end up making out on a cot, on a narrow cot, she says. And from this experience, she says, I understand my life now. My life has, has you know, everything comes into perspective, right? And it's a very powerful, powerful story. And, um, you know, I guess I had that moment myself too. Of course, it's not so. You know, <laughs> you know, there was there were cocktails. I'll admit it. There were cocktails. <laughs> um, <laughs> there were. There were screwdrivers at Sticks, which was a disco in Chelsea when I first moved to New York City in like 1979. Um, but so there's something about it, and, and okay okay i know gay 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 now right so everybody's getting gay married and all that but like you have to remember this is 1949 okay and she's telling this story about this amazing gay life in san francisco that you could just go you could go have that exact same night now only you would go to the castro you wouldn't go to north beach like the gay bars have moved <laughs> they're in a different part of town now but you could do the same thing you'd go to the drag show and the dyke bar and the gay bar and then you could you know have some cocktails and make out with a lady and um so there's something very uh 
wonderful about that to me, like that it's this, this history, this like history of lives lived, like people did these things that we still do. And um, so that's the very personal <laughs> hook. <laughs> You were attracted because of the story of this of this man that you hadn't heard of. So somebody approached you with it. Uh, yeah, um, a woman uh, a woman named Lisa Rothy, who's a wonderful director, who I went to acting school with years ago. She um, she had been introduced to Jeannie Sakata, who who was an actor, and um, she heard the story of this man, Gordon Hirabayashi, and was so compelled by the story. She was uh, she's um, Japanese American as was Gordon Hirabayashi, and as a Japanese American, she had never heard of his story until she was an adult working in Seattle. And she was so consumed with a passion for the story that she became a playwright to write his story. So this play is her first play. She's now working on a second play, but the idea that um, you, would, you would become a writer because you were basically possessed by um, the, this appetite that you had, you know, no one is telling the story. There's the story. It has to be told. Okay, I'll tell it. And, you know, and then she wrote this amazing play. Um, an amazing play that, honestly, when I first read it, I, I did not understand what a great play it was. Like, I, I read it and I thought, this is an amazing story, but I didn't, I, I hadn't read too many one-person shows before. So, on the page, I couldn't see how it was going to be dramatic or how it was going to be um, dynamic. Uh, which was a whole other story, like you know that that process of how you how do you make something active, you know, when you're by yourself. Uh, but that's a different question, I'm sure. But um, uh, so this guy Gordon Hirabayashi, he was a Japanese American Quaker, um, growing up in Seattle. Uh, writer, you know, uh, he's a 22-year-old. You know, actually, he's he's uh, he's younger than that. He's a he's a freshman in college. Uh, when you know the war breaks out, and then you know there, and then the internment happens, and as someone who is both nonviolent in his you know as as a Quaker, but also as someone who is completely in love with and idealizes the Constitution, it's it's unfathomable for him as as a citizen to to go to these camps because he just feels like it's a it's a violation of um, their constitutional rights, and so he refuses. And at the time when this happens. Uh, you know, in this world, you know, in the 1940s where nothing is really connected or, you know, it's connected in a way where, you know, days are separated between one person telling a story to another. He believes he's the only person who's taking the stand. It's a very lonely stand and it's, it goes against his, his family doesn't want him to do it. It's dangerous. Uh, the community around him doesn't want to do it. Everyone is terrified. Um, so, in essence, he feels like he is standing up against everybody, the people that he loves, his family, the United States, everything. So it, it was a tremendous act of courage on his part. And he went to jail many times. Um, but because of this an incredible personality that he had, he, he did it not in a self-righteous way, not in an angry way. His personality was such that he, it just never entered his mind that he should do such a thing, you know, because it was wrong. And so all these amazing things would happen to him as a result. His, you know, his noncompliance was such that he ended up endearing himself to everybody he came across, including the judges that would put him in jail, you know, the people who, um, all these people who, you know, who should have been his enemy or wanted him to be the enemy. Uh, he ended up befriending and having these crazy experiences all along the way. So it's a story that you c I can't even believe that I I'd never heard of before. I mean, there's a great story, for example, where um, he wants to do his time outdoor outdoors in a, in a road camp but the judge says, look, the only, the only road camp around here is in Tacoma, Washington, and now as a Japanese American, you're not allowed to be there. Um, and the, one the closest one after that is in Tucson, Arizona. That's, that's 1,600 miles away. We don't have the money to send you to Tucson, Arizona, so you can't do this. And he says, well, uh, what if I go on my own? What if I pay my own way? <laughs> and the, the judge says, well, you know, I guess if you pay your own way, sure, you can go. So then he thinks to himself, well, I can't possibly pay, pay to go to jail. That's, <laughs> that's against my principles. So what am I going to do? So then he hitchhikes. He hitchhikes the 1,600 miles, you know, 
all the way down to Tucson, Arizona, and has you know all these amazing experiences along the way, and um, and then serves his time in the road camp. And uh, anyway, so it's it's an amazing story, and one um, because of this feeling of him against the world. I think, you know, that's why Jeannie I think felt compelled to write it as a one-person show too. That it kind of accentuated his journey uh, and made it feel necessary, uh, a necessary component of telling this story, uh, which I which I totally agreed with. Well, I think I, I have to start from how I started doing solo shows. I've done three now, and I'm working on a new one right now. And um, how I came into it was was sort of a surprise to me. It, um, I was working in California at a theater festival, and I, I just decided on a lark, to because I didn't have anything pressing to go back to in New York, to do this road trip along the coast. That's where I'm from, California. And to find out the story about my father. And my father died when, when I was a baby. He was a, a scientist working at Hughes Research Laboratory and he was exposed to toxic chemicals there and started to notice he was getting sick and um, noticed where the, there was this recirculating air system so he was being exposed to these toxins um, unbeknownst to a lot of the, the people working there who were also getting sick. And he found out he had cancer and um, he took them to court and with my mother, and but he died in the middle of the trial, and my mother and my mother lost. And so, growing up in the in the shadow of him, I I never I didn't know anything about him really. It was such a, such an injustice for my mother that she she didn't really want to speak about it because it was so much pain. And so I grew up with just you know oh well, my dad was a crazy scientist and I have no idea what what happened really and you know you grow up if you're not told any of these stories growing up you just sort of accept it and um, so I, I took the journey and interviewed scientists went to the facility snuck in a camera in the facility and and um, finally had a good talk with my mom where she took down the box of all of my father's things which is just one little banker's box and read his deposition you know read um, everything and. And the story and the people I met, the scientists were so zany and amazing and my fa how my father fought and really loved his job, really loved working there and wanted to maintain it in his job and wanted to stay there and wanted to make it work. He just, he was trying to work with them. That they weren't, they were resistant. They, um, they weren't valuing their, their workers. So um, I felt I needed to tell that story. And... And I, and I thought, oh, should I make this a documentary? Because I had filmed all of it. I had done all the interviews. Um, but I was like, oh, but I'm not a filmmaker. I don't, I don't really have the craft for that. And should I write a book? I was like, I also don't have the patience to write a book. And I was like, well, I'm, a, I'm an actor. I should, I should just perform this story and, and make it, you know, really try to connect to people and bring this story in, in hopes that just getting the word out about it and also maybe making connections with other people of maybe unresolved issues around this with their losses of loved ones as well. And um, so it took a long time for me to do it. And luckily, I did a lot of it by rote from the, directly from the interviews because I was learnt, teaching myself how to write, how to write conversationally and how to write as if I was a real human and not having it sound so written. And, um, and so it, really, it was a really wonderful first step for me to do. And I started to use that piece to, because I'm, I'm primarily an activist, so I started to use that piece to engage um, with them um, the anti-fracking fight, and I started to show that, even though it's, it's, I, mean, I see them as parallel issues. You know, it's just a company that's making profit over no matter who is lost because of it, um, who gets in the way. And um, so I started to have talkbacks after the shows and take it around to different places and show clips of. I, I worked on the film Gasland. I don't know if you saw that, and um, so I started to show clips of that in its early stages, and um, just to educate, to give people a personal way into that to connect to it so it wasn't so pedagogical. And it was really healing for me and for and my connection with my mother. I understood my mother in, in such a deeper way and, and, and my empathy just you know deepened so so much. And um, I'm like, this is it. This is the way I have to work from now on. I will I will make this my my work and um and and continue to tell stories from learning about my family because I love it covers everything. I love to explore. I love to um, to travel by long bike rides. I love to meet people and and interview them and find out their stories. And I see so much. I'm lucky. I get to travel a lot, so I get to see a lot of the world. And and then I get to bring it back and process it, 
and then find a way to share it with my community here. And so it's like I'm bringing the world back you know, into the small room with people and we get to all share that together. So that's how I started. Yeah, I wonder if you all, I mean, this seems to me listening to you, and I don't know if you guys feel this, but there's a thread here which has to do with, um, I mean, those are all very different stories about, it, but there, there's some sense of deep commitment and passion about something, which I'm not sure is this, I mean, I, I think if you act in a play, you also feel that when you're acting it, but first you want to just get the job. <laughs> right? I mean, do you, do you think, I mean, there, there, there's something, the way you all talk about this is, is uh, seems to have that extra component. Yeah, I mean, Holland frequently said, you know, that she was, she shuddered when people said things like, oh, it's a vanity piece or, you know, anything like that, because she was like, really? I'm 70. Do I need to be on stage <laughs> by myself for two hours, you know? At, like, really? What's vain about that? <laughs> so, I mean, she was compelled. It was a calling. It was something that she actually, uh, you know, still is like, what? Why did I do that um, to myself, you know? So it was a, 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 it was a, a passion about it, for sure. I think something, you know, as a, um, you know, as professional actors, you know, uh, like, you know, guns for hire, freelance workers, like however you want to think about it, um, what tends to happen over a period of time, I mean, one of the things that, that really appeals to me as an actor is this idea of service, you know, and um, whether it's being an activist or, but just, just the word service. And, you know, when I fell in love with the theater and when I was training, my job is to serve the play. Like, that's, that's my training. You serve the play. But then, you know, 10 years out, 15 years out, 20 years out as an actor, you're trying to serve, you, 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 you gotta get a job, you know, and, and whatever job. And, and then you, oh, and that's over, and then you gotta get another job, you know? And so, there's something so refreshing to be reminded. Uh, it, it's so much easier when you feel a tremendous when you feel a sense of necessity, you know, when you have the appetite, when you have a tremendous appetite to do the task that's in front of you, you know, and, and, and then when you couple the idea of service with it, it takes the edge off. There's something so beautiful about working for something other than how good you look in your headshot. Y you know what I mean? Like there's something, s uh, it, it kind of re re returns me to what I love about doing this, um, because it, when you're in service of something, y you're reminded of the circuit of things, and theater is beautiful for that, uh, so much more beautiful than, than television or film, because you're putting things out there and it's coming back in. You're putting things out there and something else is coming back in, and there's that circuit of things, and, and you're doing it together kind of a thing, and that makes that makes um, it very rewarding on a very immediate moment-to-moment -moment level, and then it then it's really then it's easy to remember why you do what you do because you're experiencing it right now. You know, sometimes like when you're when you're you know when you're doing something in front of a camera and you're standing out in the rain at three in the morning for nine hours to get a thirty-second scene in, and then you realize that you don't even like what you're doing <laughs> or who you're playing, and in fact you despise what the piece is saying about the world, you know, all these kind of things. These questions that you don't ask until you get home and you realize, oh my God. Um, and, then, and then you wait, and, and you're not even gonna see the scene that? for, what's that? I just wonder if anybody else has experienced that. Well, you're not gonna see that scene for six months even. Then you're gonna sit around and, then, and you're gonna be like, God, I can't wait, oh, six months. And then you see it and you're like, oh right, I hate this. This is <laughs> reprehensible. Uh, and, and, and so, but you're just putting stuff out there and it's not coming back and so you get lost and you forget and then, so you're focusing on getting your next job or whatever and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, you know, that's, well, there is something wrong with that but, there, but, but there's, there's nothing, um, that's kind of par, you know, when you're, when you're living this lifestyle but it's good to be reminded that it, it's not all that, you know, like you, you are, you know, service. You're, you're, you're in service, you aim to be of service. Um, I thought maybe it would be interesting, and there were a lot of questions relating to process uh, from the audience, so um, 
so let's let's move in the, in that direction. I mean, I I don't know if there's a common methodology for developing a show. Because you've 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 mentioned um, some others. I mean, even obviously you you two have um, made your own shows, and the kind of research you might have to do. So, I guess. Um, well, for the two of you, I mean, what are the challenges that you find in writing, directing, and, and acting in your own piece? And I saw the one, one question, I just have to read it. It says, how do you start writing a solo performance when you hate writing? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, but how much research is involved? I well, mean, you just said you were going yeah, up Yeah, you were talking, we were talking a little bit backstage about going through the archives and everything, so that's probably, I mean, that's, I, uh, you know, Holland did everything. Holland did, that's you know? what I asked. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Holland, Holland took three years and studied everything she could and also invited anyone that had ever met Ann Richards to sit and talk with her. I mean, she, her process was hilarious when you think about it because, and I, when I took the job, said to her at some point, did you ever think of having a writer write this? And not like to insult her about it, because I liked the play, obviously, I took the job. But she looked at me and said, well, who would have took three years to research this? And well, they wouldn't have had to, because they would have been writing your play. But that was how, that was, I mean, the, the well, truth. Wait a minute, is that true? Because, you know, sometimes it I mean, is, yeah, sometimes it does take three years, but also if you're hired to write something, you're usually hired to write something in a span of time that, you know, like, can we see the first draft in said amount of time? I mean, she, she part of what took her three years was she was working as an actress and doing all those other things, and so filling, you know, her free time with trips to Austin and trips to everywhere that, you know, all these amazing people that were part of Anne's life are now and um, and so she had to go through all of that and everything and um, she combed the archive in Austin um, Ann Richards personal archive in Austin uh, our bankers boxes that would fill I can't even remember the number now but it's like 10 football fields long so I mean she and her house now is nothing, you know, one room is nothing but everything about Ann Richards, and um, and <laughs> what was funny for me is when I came onto the project, I, you know, said to her, can you, like, uh, you know, what should I start to delve into and everything? She was like, you don't have to, I've done all that, and I said, well, well, uh, I need to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and then the email started, um, and then I thought I need another email address because this inbox is so full of information I'll never get through it. She just was sending you. Oh yeah, the forwards, the forwards, and the pictures, and the files, and the everything. So I mean, it, it went on for days and days and days, which was what I came to realize that was her character work. Um, I mean, that was like, as, as a performer, you understand, like, uh, and sometimes part of the problem at that, you know, film shoot is like you got the lines, you know, 30 minutes ago, and so there is nothing behind it, and you're, you're not interested in what you're doing, so you haven't had the time to fill it with anything or, you know, do any research or anything, but she needed that three years to do that performance, and that's why it was so nuanced and full and everything, because she wasn't an expert on everything about Ann Richards politically and all that kind of stuff, but she had spent enough time with the people that knew her that, or she could just shoot off an email and say, how would Ann say this? Um, and they would give her that nugget of information, and so that that was really enlightening to know, like, that's what that was really about, um, that research process. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a problem of biography, actually, yeah. which is a, a lot I thought about, uh, I thought about the same things during uh, the time that I was r researching and writing the uh, did you do piece. research just in the journals, or did you, because it sounds like Holland was very extroverted in her research. Oh, yeah, I, I, I you know, cast a wide net, absolutely. I went to, uh, uh, Susan Sontag sold her, um, her papers and her personal library to the University of California, Los Angeles, and it's in their special collections. You can, you, you're all welcome to go visit it. It's open to the public. 
it's really amazing, you know. Her personal library that she had <laughs> in her apartment in London Terrace was 20,000 books. Many of them annotated, many, many, many of them annotated, right? She was a, you know, she was a, a, a I don't know, a, a, a lifelong student. She was trained as a philosopher. That was uh, what she did her graduate work in. And she, th she th had <laughs> a lot of thoughts. So, um, <laughs> um, so I, uh, I, you know, I tried my best to read as much as I could. There's the, the, in the show, there's uh, at the very beginning, she's 15, she says, there are so many books and plays and stories I have to read. Here are just a few. <laughs> and then follows a list of, you know, 40 titles, whatever. I mean, I had to cut it. I couldn't even use all of them. And, um, you know, she had already done at 15 what I will never do in my, in my lifetime, you know. She had this incredible, she was a voracious reader. And um, I, I, I tried. <laughs> I tried to read some of, you know, get through some of it, but God, I mean, you know, Lord, the woman just, she read all the time, especially when she was a youngster. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like researching very much, and in my work with the Builders Association, which is the company that uh, created the piece, um, you know, we, we do a lot of research, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, so... It is, it's a gold mine, you know? And in terms of the text, like how did I decide what parts to use? I really looked at the text, like what did she leave us? What did she leave us? And I tried to look for clues, like, okay, what is she, you know, what is her narrative? What is she telling us, you know? Because that's a, you know, she's choosing what stories to tell. You can't tell all the stories in your own life. And then even if you could, like, you know, I couldn't tell them all on stage, so I had to choose, right? I had to choose. So, I, you know, I really tried to say, well, what was important to her? What was important to her, you know? And it's her intellectual, um, um, well, it's her construction of self, actually. That is the sort of overall story of the piece, I would say, and of her journals, and perhaps of anyone's journals. I don't know. She was very feverish about her construction of self, though, way more than I was at that age, um, or ever. <laughs> so, yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Well, your question really stumped me, because I was like, challenges? There's so many challenges to making a show. It's just, even. To, I mean, I guess one of the first things is, I've never done it. No, that's not true. I did, in my senior year of high school, I did uh, Lily Tomlin's solo show, The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. And that kind of, you know, was the seed. My, my acting teacher gave me that gift to um, believe in myself to create that whole thing. And, and I haven't since then done a, a, another different character show than auto, other than autobiographical. But... Um, I guess believing in yourself is one of the most difficult things, believing that you can sustain, you know, and, and keep the audience throughout that hour, or I try to keep it short, usually an hour, hour 20 at the most, um, with an audience, um, can, you can keep their attention, that you can hold the room, and that you can, you know, really do, like you said, do service to that story, all on your lonesome. That's, you know, a huge thing to battle and go back and forth with, having faith in yourself and being able to hold that up and to and to never i mean r working with personal material to worry about to always like s you know kind of straddle that balance of okay to let myself tell tell my truth but not 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 go too much into into um, you know arrogance or or too much the other side into embarrass embarrassment or to you know debase myself you know but to like, balance that and really just find just the simple truth of it to communicate with people and to not let your ego be like, oh, don't say that because then people will think that you're, you know, bragging about something or don't say this because it's too personal or don't say that, you know, that there's just so many sensors that are constantly coming in in the editing process and just the editing process, like you're talking about research, I've, I haven't, I haven't had to do that much research because it's my own stories, but, but um, at a certain point you sort of become a slave to detail. 
And you're just like, oh, well now I'm like, what am I doing? Am I an archivist? Am I like, you know, re researching and sussing the, like all the details of this to, to make sure they get in inserted and to make sure that everything is, you know, perfectly sculpted and to be this, you know, whole thing. But after a while, you're just like, no, just give it some air and, and let the story knows what it needs to be. And you just have to sort of, you know, let it lift off from all of that weight of, of you know, the gravity of trying to get everything. Like before I did, um, I've done two shows that, that, that took me a while that were more personal shows, the story about my father, and then I did another story about my grandfather. We went to, to Poland, I biked across Poland, and my grandfather was this crazy, wild, experimental theater director and who escaped from a concentration camp with his Norwegian wife, Nancy, that my mom thinks that Casablanca was based on his story and they stole it. <laughs> and, um, but really amazing story. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very dark history of a lot of violence and, and a lot of darkness, and um, that took me five years to really, you know, go into that and and I w couldn't censor myself and I couldn't like and also worrying about you know conversations with my family members sometimes I've played my family members and I I tried forever to hide the video of, of the the first play about my my father to my mom and then eventually she saw it and and she loved it and that sort of you know broke broke a barrier with us but there's a lot of a lot of fear about generating you know, self-generated work and, and creating your own piece about your life that's, um, you know, it's, oh, man. If you guys are going to do that, like, God be with you. It's, <laughs> like, what it's... Do you, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting... One of the things you brought up there is, like, knowing when to cut something out. You know, I know, like, like I when I write poetry, there's always that kill your darlings thing. You yeah. know, that sentence that you love about, you know, and it was just this wonderful turn of phrase. And I, I sort of know whenever I feel like that about something that I just might as well just cut it out right then, yeah. you yeah. know, even though it's so pretty. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so when when you're do when you're working on this, do you working are you working solo or how are you getting feedback or workshopping or working on your work? Me, I, I do eventually work with a director towards the end of the process. So I'll take, like with the Wild Finish, the Polish show that that was almost, you know, four and a half years, going back and forth to it sometimes and working on it and writing on my own and then bringing in a director for like the last few months. And um, and I try to share it with a lot of people, like with Blondie of Arabia, when I came back from the Middle East, I never intended to make a show out of that. I didn't set out on a journey. I, I actually had a catering job. I worked for this high-end catering company that worked at the royal wedding party in Qatar, the Sheha. And <laughs> I went along to be the sanitation captain. And, and so I'm like, I'm bringing my bicycle. Just leave me here. I will bike to the Middle East. I'll be fine. And um, then when I came back, I kept telling stories to people because everyone wanted to know. And, um, and I was trying to write this other play, the Polish play, at the same time. And, it, and then finally a dramaturg friend of mine was like, what are you doing, Monica? Write this play. Like, you, you keep telling these stories. And, and I was learning, you know, in the back of my mind, I was learning how, you know, you teach yourself how to tell stories. And you hear when people laugh and you hear, like, what's unnecessary and when, you know. So that, that story, that, I wrote that play in two months just because I'd already been, like, carving it. And, and luckily a good friend of mine, right when I came back, like, two days after I got back from that trip, she said she wanted to record me telling about every single day of my trip. So I sat there and I recounted the whole thing in two days with her. And then I went back, when I decided to make it a play, I went back and I just you know, wrote out everything. I listened to myself in the recording and I wrote out everything that I said so I could go back because it was still fresh. Um, but I find it really helpful to work with an outside eye at the end. I'm not that good yet to work totally alone. I need to have, after a while, I just go crazy. You know, you're in the room by yourself and you're like, is, am I insane? Is no one gonna like this? Is this just, you know, what, what am I doing? And, and, um, and you really need to just, just to, you know, bounce it off of someone and get some feedback and have someone in the room. And then eventually, you know, then in bring in more and more people because like you're saying, like you have the audience. Like I very much speak to the audience the whole time. And, and so it, it changes the whole show. If I haven't shown to any small groups of people or any people before I do a show, it will throw me off so much to be in front of an audience and be like, oh, the timing is all wrong. They're responding, they're laughing here. I had no idea this was a comedy. When, you know, like just things like that will happen. But I find feedback really helpful. 
I was hoping one of the performers would mention, you know, having a collaborator, and I wouldn't be the one that would have to say that. So, um, <laughs> I was like, going back to your, you know, your question about like, what do you do when you hate writing? Like, uh, I would say collaborate with somebody. I mean, that's a shared experience. Just because you're the solo performer doesn't mean you can't have collaborators, and you can have people to bounce things off of, and also help work y through things and. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you said that, and I didn't have to. So, <laughs> um, so you you said something uh, a bit ago about not being able to be sure how this would this story it was a great story, but how you would really create the the drama of it or the performance. So I'm sort of wondering, with all of you, as, and as a director too, the notion of how you create uh, sort of how do, you, how do you choreograph the story? You know, what are the changes from, you know, big um, big moments, little moments, soft? Or I don't. What was one of the things that uh, that's a little different uh, in my experience is that someone, uh, you know, Jeannie wrote the play, so there was an immediate collaboration the second I was brought. In, like I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm collaborating with her. You know, I'm I'm trying to serve her play. And I'm also trying to serve Gordon's story. So a lot of the time there was that question of what is it that I'm trying to do? Am I try and, and where, where does the research fall? Where, am, I trying to, am I trying to, you know, mimic Gordon? You know, because there's, no, you know, there's no shortage of information about him. You know, if you look, and, and Jeannie had met him a bunch and interviewed him. I had access to so many resources that, you know, she had done all this amazing work and befriended Gordon, you know, in his life, during his lifetime. Um, you know, and Mo talked about it a little bit. She, um, I forget the word you used. I know edit came up once, but I feel like, uh, you know, my role, yes, you're, I'm in service, but also I have to curate and interpret um, what's there. You know, like, like I, you know, we have, in this process of telling the story, we have to make choices about, because you, you, you can't tell everything. And, and sometimes there's two things right next to each other, but for the purposes of your story, you're only going to tell one of them because that crafts the story a little bit, a bit, bit better. And some people might say who knew that story, well, you forgot the whole other part. That changes the idea of the story. You're curating and interpreting. You know, it's, you're not, you're, and you're not curating and interpreting an entire life, real or imagined. You are, you're curating and interpreting a play, you know, um, a, which is a separate, it's a separate event than a life, you know? It's, it's uh, 90 minutes or two hours, and, and that's what I'm trying to craft. And so, you know, there's so many, there's so many characters in Hold These Truths, and so it was a question of like, you know, um, Justice Frank Murphy on the Supreme Court. Well, uh, oh, he's, now, he's you know, doing research on him, and oh, he's from here, and actually, you know, and he, he he probably sounded like this, but in the flow of the story and the way that things were going, I made a choice that he's gonna sound like that, different. So if Frank Murphy's family was there, I'm not doing Frank Murphy for his family, I'm doing Frank Murphy to further the story along. So it's, it's different. So sometimes I would feel like I'm not, you know, I was having to choose what I was serving in a given time. And ultimately at the end of the day, it's the story. It's not, you know, it's not, Frank Murphy, it's not Gordon A to Z, it's, you know, it's the story. Um, and sometimes that was hard, and sometimes, you know, we're, so much, you know, you have to free yourself, you know, you have to free yourself from all the sensors that come into your mind, and all, you know, the obstacles that happen, and just the things that get in your way, you know, when you're performing, but, um, when they're real people, too, you know, like your father, you know, or, um, or Susan Sontag, or, you know, the governor. It's like, you know, y you, have to, you have to relieve yourself of that burden. You have to allow also for the creative spirit, which sometimes screams in the face of accuracy or, or, um, or uh, realism, you know, and, and you really must embrace it because, and sometimes you go a long way around. Sometimes you have to obliterate what really happened in order to come back around it, or sometimes your interpretation of it is nothing like what really happened, but you convey the sense of it so much more brilliantly 
than by creating a little docudrama of the, you know, of what actually happened, you know. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, I mean, sometimes to get at the truth, you can't be completely truthful or real. You can't be well, what really we're, happened. We're, we're, we're doing a, you know, we're doing a one-person theatrical piece in front of you. We're not, we're not making a documentary. We're not doing docudrama. We're not, and, and so, you know, we sa said earlier, like, by any means necessary, whatever tools we have to tell this story, well, so what's the important part of that story? If the, you know, if we can convey that in a way that's not literally what happened, sometimes we have to do that. Yeah. Sometimes it's the opposite. It is hard, though, when it's, when it's supposed to be documentary or autobiographical to know. I mean, you, you might want to compress 10 different incidents of, in the person's life into one. Well, supposed to be. That's, you know, yeah. what, what, are, what is it supposed to be? Like, yeah. that's the question you have to answer. Because if it is documentary, then, that's, then you make those choices. But if, you know, I think we're all saying here that so much of the time that's not the choice that we're making. We're not making a documentary, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's, that's something, I don't know if we've quite said that yet, but that's interesting. Oh, yeah. But one of the really hard things that, you know, we came to with, and um, was how much of her personal life became a part of the story. It was really important. I mean, not that it wasn't allowed, but it was really important to Holland that everyone gets a full thing about, and it's not just about her political life. It's not a, pol it's not a play about a politician. Um, and one of the things that carried through in Anne's life was her failed marriage. Um, and when I came on, there was a lot more about it in the play. Um, and it was one of the hardest things for me to continually kind of edit through because um, she wanted to hang on to it because she knew how much Anne hung on to it. Um, and the biggest issue for me when I was editing it down was that um, it just created so many more questions that you could, didn't have the time to answer as well. Um, it was that thing, it just kept spinning and you were like, okay, tell me another story about how badly she missed him at the end of her life and then keep going, don't stop there. And um, so it just, you know, kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And, you know, that was, it, it's still painful. She still blames me for a lot of things um, <laughs> that I cut from the show. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, it was it was it was our you know hard part of the, of the collaboration for sure. Um, and even at talkbacks, people would bring it up and say, "Oh, so what did happen there?" and everything. And she'd look at me with those you know, <laughs> I, and, and I say, say, "Well, there's really good books that t talk about it." <laughs> Thank you. Send you an email. When you're on, when yes. You're, when you're a solo performer, um, how do you how how can you evoke or deal with silence? Like in a play with other people, you know, you can use silence very effectively. Sorry? I wanted, I wanted to ask Mo a question, actually. Go could ahead. I? In, I was just thinking because of what you brought up in, in your play, which was such a beautiful moment when, um, when it's the, the year of her, her, her marriage, like the first year of the marriage, and, and the, the video shot of, of older Sontag is is just flipping through the journal and and not saying anything and going page by page through these years. It was years, right? Not just year. And and young Sontag was kind of pacing, turned away from the audience. And it was silent and it was just this I won I wondered what why you chose that. And I loved it so much because of what it wasn't saying about what was happening in that marriage, but I wondered what was going on for you. Well, uh, you know, she uh, she she got married and then she had a son and the first two years of his life, there are no journals. So it was her silence, you know? She didn't write, she either didn't write, or she probably didn't have time. I mean, she was a, she was a new mom and she was only, you know, she was a teen mother. Susan Sontag was a teen mother, everybody. <laughs> she was 19 <laughs> years old, you know, she was. And, um, you know, what that's like, I mean, I guess, I don't know what that's like, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of, documentation you can refer to. <laughs> it's hard to be a mom and you know she didn't have time to write, you know. So there's nothing there's no there were no, either no journals, she either didn't write or they were lost or they were destroyed. But I think probably she just didn't write. And um so that was it was just her silence, you know. But silence is very important. It's very very important to calibrate that and that you know that is the great incredible 
partnership that I have with Marianne uh, Weems, who directed the piece, is that I can't, she is, um, she's all about the tempo and, you know, calibrating the uh, ride of the performance, the whole thing, right? I can't, I mean, I can modulate that if I'm told. <laughs> but if I'm just going on my own steam, you know, like it gets, it can get really out of whack. So that is the great gift that she gives and that any director gives is to say, okay, slow down here, let them hear what you're saying, go faster there, that's not that important, but it's amusing, so go get through it already, <laughs> get on to the next thing, just stop, just stop, just don't do anything right now, just be quiet, you know, because something, something big has just happened, and people need a second to let it sink in, right? So silence, I think, is very, very important, and, um, and she actually wrote about silence quite a lot, too, and about John Cage, and stuff like that so it has it, it's very meta it's very very meta, <laughs> meta um, <laughs> so um anyway go on <laughs> anybody has something to say about silence anybody else um so one question is so when you're building your stories i'm, I'm still going on to process because i've been trying trying to imagine do you build from the climax of the story do you, how do you build the story? I mean, where do you start from like, is a, an a, uh, accumulation of all the various stories within the story? Do you know where, do you have a sense of where it's gonna end before you start? I guess, I guess it's, always, it's always different, really. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really at the beginning it's amassing and amassing and amassing material and all of the stories and just getting it out and getting it out and getting it out and getting it out, and getting it out all of it, you know, like all of, um, when I was working on the, the first piece about my father, that was, you know, I, I had a lot of that information there. So going through all of those videos and I was like, well, all of this could be just from Jurg Jurgensen, you know, this one, um, one of the scientists, um, I guess he was so interesting. It could be like all from his perspective or it could be all, all, you know, all from my mother's or it could be all my sister's or it could be, you know, like finding the voice of it and, um, and finding like asking, asking myself the question at the beginning, like what is, what is the question of the play? Mm -hmm. What, how do I begin and then how am I changed at the end? I must be changed. And um, what is that, that point that, that changes me? And getting to that itself is, is incredibly hard. And because I may not, you know, because you have to be really self-aware to write like your own autobiographical play where you're like, yes, and then uh, I became enlightened at this point and then I <laughs> did this, you know, like that's, <laughs> it's, it's, I'm kind of just, you know, like, throwing things out and stabbing in the dark and seeing what, what hits. And if, it, if I see it works narratively, it's like what you're saying, that sometimes, um, you know, the, the, the story that you're gonna tell and the arc you're gonna tell in an hour, an hour and a half is, is its own world, it's its own narrative. And so it may not be my, you know, it's not gonna be my three year journey or that two month bicycle journey, everything going to be there, but it will be the kernel of, you know, the essence of it in a way. And so, I try to find the, the texture and um, the question and, yeah, the moment I change, I guess. Like, oh, I, I, I was just thinking it, exactly. Um, one of the big changes, we had several incarnations of Anne in Texas sev uh, several different times and then in Chicago and then Washington, D.C. And you just mentioned, do you start at the climax? And what's funny for me is actually I pushed Holland to write a different climax between um, the Washington, D.C. production and for Broadway. Um, and I had been feeling it probably since the first day I read the play that I didn't, there was a a moment in it for me where I felt the same great sense of loss that Holland felt in being compelled in writing the play. The whole thing felt like that, but there wasn't that one moment where I, just like my breath was taken away in 2013 where I was like, that's what I've been here for. Um, and so in the Broadway production at Lincoln Center, um, and as we were building up towards it, I kept saying, I'm missing what was the speech that she never gave. Um, and it became a 
you know, it became a separate scene where she was working in her New York office in her later parts of her lives, and then she used to just transition tr into talking about her death. Um, and I had her, you know, go from working in that office in New York City, working on a speech that Ann Richards actually was working on and never got to give, um, giving us the speech, delivering the speech out to us, and saying the things that we desperately need to hear from Ann Richards in this day and age, um, and then cutting it off and saying, I never got to give that speech, um, which, you know, for me, just brought it all around, and you know, and it, it in the audience you could feel everyone, you know, tense up and go, "That, oh, she didn't, but she did. She just did, right here in front of our eyes." Um, and and so, you know, while Holland had had, and and the real hard thing in that for Holland was writing words that Anne didn't say. Um, and she kept saying, I can't do that, I can't do that. And I said, you've written a whole play of words that she didn't say, um, but be the playwright now. Like, I need to know what you think she would actually be telling us in this day and age, so. Um, okay, just back to process a minute. Cause I, okay, so a solo show is not just one person. So aside from the writing, the working on it, how many, how do you workshop it? What do you learn and work, or do you workshop it? And I, I'm just assuming that you do. And what do you learn? How much does the play change? For um, okay, well, I, I actually did not workshop this piece too much um, because we didn't have money. <laughs> so um, I worked closely with Marianne Weems, my director, you know, my, my right-hand lady, and you know, I would I would go and cobble away and then come and read to her in her living room and then she would make suggestions and then I would go off again. So it was very, this kind of back and forth between us, just working on the script only until we actually had a date to do it at uh, the Under the Radar Festival in last year, 2012, I guess, in January, last January. And then we did a very, very compressed rehearsal process of like, 12 days of rehearsal, which is, you know, v unheard of for the Builders Association because it's very technologically embedded. So there's a lot of video, there's very beautiful s soundscape. It's always very pretty. Um, so, but normally the builders would do workshops, would workshop things, but we just didn't have the resources for this particular piece. And, it w you know, we were trying to make a chamber piece. We were trying to make a small piece because usually the pieces, you know, require 14 people to travel and that just like, you know, not in this economy, people, not in this economy. It just does not happen. You know, it's uh, very difficult to travel with a lot of people right now. So um, that's how I did this, this one, mostly working on my own talking to Marianne, you know. But, and also, just uh, one other thing I w need to say about collaboration is that, you know, there, there is an idea, there's, it is one thing to have an idea, it is a very different thing to execute that idea, to make that idea happen. That is a whole other ball game, you know. You know, so, so these people that w worked with me and, you know, gave their incredible talents to this piece y are as much, they have an authorial voice in it as well, not not just me, you know, because um, it's a t it's a total it's a total thing, you know. I don't even know like if it's a script. I mean, it is a script. There's words, but I don't know because of how it's constructed with this heavy video element, which is another character in the show. I don't I don't know if you could say, well, here do this script to someone else in the same way that you would like Lily Tomlin could. So, anyway, just to say. Your collaborators, they're, they're a gold mine. And, you know, like, let them be in the room with you. The, th the thing about the builders, too, in terms of technology, there is this very, very heavy technological element. And those designers, the video designer, the lighting designer, the scenic designer, not so much the costume designer all the time, the sound designer, are in the room from rehearsals from the very first day of rehearsal, okay? So it's not like the actors, you know, rehearse, and then there's tech week where all that tech comes in and, you know, you throw all this tech at the show. No, that, that stuff is developed, uh, you know, side by side with the play, uh, normally speaking, in the builders. 
yeah, it's, it's, it is very much a workshop in the rehearsal process, absolutely. Okay, someone else talk about process. <laughs> Actually, would you, let's let's talk about props and let's talk about media. I mean, I mean, is there ever a time that you there's a certain prop that gives you a key to your character or that you have? Does you it need your bicycle. <laughs> you need your bicycle. She couldn't even walk in here without her backpack. That's her basic prop. <laughs> I'm gonna try riding a bicycle play. That's gonna be my next thing. I'm just gonna ride on my bike and see what happens. Well, so now people are adding a lot of media into in, into the story, and yeah. you know I come up from out of the world of interactive media, but um, and so how do, how do you choose to use it? When do you think it really adds to it? When do you think it like it sort of detracts? Do you want to talk? A little yeah, I sometimes. So it, usually I would do a little clip at the end. It was kind of the, the, the end of the play. Even after a, a curtain call, I would just do like a really quick montage video of the real people and the real story, like either photos or video. And it, it always would depend either which, which workshop or which festival or which theater I would do it, whether I wanted to use that or not. And sometimes just I couldn't because it didn't have the capacity or some, even sometimes I've had to, it didn't work. I'm like, here's a, my laptop, everyone crowd around. <laughs> but it's always different. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, that's the, the point with that where people really go either way. Some people will write me and they'll be like, I hated that you showed me the video because I had this whole idea in my mind about what those people looked like and blah, 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 and you just ripped it away from me. And some people are like, oh, I loved it so much. It made it all real and I connected to it and I cried and um, I felt like I was with them all again. And um, so it's always really polarizing them. And, and I, I, I don't know either way. I mean, I liked showing it because I felt like now I give you the gift, you know, to have at the end. Like, and a lot of times, for like for the the Middle Eastern show, people didn't believe me. They're like, oh, "Yeah, right, you didn't do this." And so, like, "Aha, a video!" <laughs> and then it was just to show it was true. But I really don't know. I'm I'm really kind of not sure. I would love, like, I would love to be able to do something like you've done. I don't have that savvy and and. Um, I, I really, I really don't. Luckily, I, I've never worked with a whole technological team. I worked, I worked with two, two directors in these past three shows, um, separately. Really wonderful women who are also my friends. And, and, um, and just note about that, collaborators. That, it's yeah, to work on personal material, you have to. It's so important to find the right person to work with, really, that you're going to share that material with, and, um, you know, that they don't, you don't ever feel like you're in. in posing on them too much, that they really have that patience to hear it and that you feel ready to share that material with them at the right moment. So I've been blessed with great friends and directors at the same time. But that's also the same thing with the video. It's, it's sort of like, um, do you want to, do you want to reveal that or not? It's, it's like, you know, how much do you want to show? And with this, I, I kind of love saving it to the end because I don't, because I want the audience, like I said earlier, to have that space to imagine the whole world themselves. Because we're always so over-mediated, you know, everyone is iPhones constantly in front of them and, and iPads and like, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are, have been texting throughout this whole thing, haven't you? <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just, you know, that's where our culture is going. And so I, I kind of love the challenge of what if that's it? What if you only have me and there's nothing else fancy or exciting, you know, going on. Some, I do love lights and music. I do love to work with sound. But um, I don't know, that's, that's a challenge I set for myself. I don't think it's necessarily the right way or needs to be. It's also because I'm pretty poor and I can't handle getting other artists to work with for that. But I guess that's it. You know, that, uh, one of the, some of the questions from the audience were things about, were, were relating to this, so we talk about it, and I think you hinted at it a lot. I mean, in, in a way, it turns out that Holland was very brave to pick somebody who kind of disagreed with her a lot. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, the question of how do you choose the right director or sound director, uh, sound designer, um, you know, what's, and what's the team you need to get together for a successful production? I mean, you, so. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, we disagreed to, in order to make the show better, you know, I mean, that was really where, and and, you know, strangely, I, I recognized early on the show my role was actually to be as transparent as possible, um, to not look like you know the production was directed, um, and because it needed to be about 
experiencing Anne, and I wasn't there to show off and be like, yeah, I'm just going to put my stamp on this and everything. And I think the few things that I kind of brought to it were, um, w I mean, were actually were a little bit technological. She had written that the show opened with the 1988 um, DNC speech, and um, she just envisioned herself just kind of standing behind a scrim and people would understand what that was and there was would be just like a flicker of a light and it was a film being shown. And so I said, well, actually, very simply with projection, we can make that happen. And well, we don't need a, we don't need projection in this show. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we continued to collaborate and talk about where it else it could serve the story without being like, let me show you what this person looked like without becoming a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and so I talked her through those kind of things, but always just kind of led her down the path so that they were ideas that were coming from the impetus of her writing the story already. So, it, you know, she didn't really know how to work with a projection designer or what that could do for her. So I would just kind of give her a little shove in the direction and then all of a sudden it was like, well, we could have this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And um, I had created a monster and then it was about <laughs> editing, editing again. Um, uh, but, if, you know, we did, we did disagree. It was funny, you were talking about, you know, killing your darlings. I've always heard, you know, killing your babies, um, which is, you know, even worse. <laughs> but pretty ones. what's funny is that on one of our days of previews, I had set out the task of cutting five full paragraphs in a row. They were large paragraphs, and they were things that she'd had since the first day she wrote the script. And I was walking to s through the sludge of the snow, and I walked right past Mike Nichols, who was one of those people who's famous for that phrase, and a friend of Holland's and everything. And I thought, well, if there isn't a sign, <laughs> then I don't know what is. Mike would cut those paragraphs <laughs> and <laughs> walked in and faced her, and she fought, and she stormed around and everything, and then had, and hated it, all because... It, it was all coming from fear. I mean, she's the only person out there. There's no one to say, you yeah, skip this line, you know, and if she fell, falls off, wh how does she get herself back? It was all about that. And so I was just there to kind of help prop her up, say, you can do it. We're going to rehearse it as many times as possible. You'll get it in tonight. And then at the end of the night, she looked at me and said, okay, I like it, you know, <laughs> and she understood it. And and so I knew I had to, uh, had to fight her at times in order to you know, help the show along, um, and she needed to be fought sometimes. You, um, how, do you, how do you raise money for this kind of thing? There were a lot of questions about that. <laughs> Kickstarter. Okay, your Kickstarter is... <laughs> yeah. we, we raised a little bit of money, um, I think it was $5,000 uh, on Kickstarter to do the uh, the initial rehearsal period for Under the Radar. Um, then there's a lot of grant writing. Um, that, yeah. When you go for a grant, when you go for a grant, you write a grant, you know, I'm going to have to hire a director. I have to, do you pay yourself in the grant? Well, I, there's a line item. <laughs> Whether it, <laughs> it actually gets executed is another story. But it does go into the grant writing, yes. And it gets executed is another story? No, no, no. I said it, whether it gets executed oh, is oh, another I story. In other words, whether I actually get that money, yeah. you know, depends. I mean, it's my choice to say, no, we need this for something else. Mm. In this piece, in, in, the, in the builders, generally speaking, no. That if, if, I, if I have a contract that says I'm being paid, I am being paid. Mm -hmm. And um, that's amazing, actually. Um, for a small company. Um, but, you know, the whole script was written on spec. I mean, I just was working with Marianne. We were using our own time and our own, you know, resources. We didn't have a pr production in mind uh, or a, a date. So that happens. Uh, 
the the piece was already being produced when I when I came in. So. Um, it's yeah. just important to point out that you know you you raise money, but also you, I mean you're just saying you put a lot of your own into it. I mean you know Holland's pocketbook was flying everywhere doing all that. I mean that she was fronting all of that to make the project happen, and that five thousand dollars that you got didn't go towards research when you went to UCLA. That was you know yeah, yeah separate. Yeah, well that's like writing a book or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully you can. Later on, you can take off the expenses. Yeah. Right. Save your receipts. Save your receipts. <laughs> Most important thing for anybody doing. Um, so we, we haven't talked. Uh, this is. I'm going to end here. We, we were going to talk about the future of storytelling, but you know, at the end of the evening is here, so the future of storytelling will have to wait. But um, <laughs> we. we it's, coming. <laughs> it's coming. Believe me, <laughs> starting tomorrow. What? It's evolving. Um, no, I mean I was interested in it because I work in a lot with interactive. Business. It seems to me that you're, you know, the process is a very interactive piece. I keep thinking of this Conrad quote where he says, "In the tragic element, immerse yourself." So take out tragic and just put whatever. In the Susan Sontag element, immerse yourself. And so if you're completely swimming in that sea for a long time, there must be there's a, there has to be a, probably a several month period where you understand it, you've grokked it, but you can't bring it out into into a linear form, and then eventually it sort of happens in some way. I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> well, I no, think never I, mind. I think, no, no, uh, I maybe think everyone not. has spoken about a certain um, just outpouring and then, an, and then an editorial process, yeah. right? So you just put yeah. everything in there, you know, you put everything in the bucket, and then, you know, eventually what needs to I know I don't want to sound all loopy about this, but it's like the story will present itself to you, you know, the story that needs to be told. And I know that sounds, you know, what fruity, but it's true. I mean, what it, what is compelling will rise to the top, and um, yeah, and so it's 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 more it's more a thinning out, like a falling away of the elements that are, you know, that is so fascinating, that is so hysterical, oh my God, that's so tragic. But it's not, it's, it's taking us somewhere else that, than, than the thrust of this story that, that you know, that we're telling. Um, and, or, or, but sometimes, sometimes you leave them in too, you know, you leave the detours in as well, but. We, we, we haven't talked much about the performance of it. I've been talking all about asking you questions about process. But at the, at the time of performance, and um, Joel, you mentioned a little bit about the interaction with the audience, how important it is. I don't know, is it, does it feel different when it's a solo performance versus another kind of acting performance? Um, well, f uh, for me, um, in this process, absolutely. I mean, um, I, had a, I had a great experience where we did the play um, uh, off Broadway in the fall, and then someone, a friend of mine, came to see it who lives in Hawaii and thought, "Gosh, people in Hawaii would really love this project." So he he co-produced the piece with uh, a professional theater in Hawaii, and we we got to take the um, the the play over there for a brief run in February. And the audiences have always been amazing, but doing getting to experience the play with a different audience, a Hawaiian audience, a, a predominantly you know, Asian American audience, uh, many of whom are, you know, Japanese, um, was one of the most remarkable things I've ever experienced because um, these were people who, whether they knew specifically of the story or not, th there was a resonance there um, coming into the piece uh, that was so remarkable and something that I've never really experienced before. And um, one of the things about this piece that I love uh, is the fact that you know, as a one-person show, the the person telling the story gets to embody because the, this the story really is a great American story. It's about this guy who is Japanese American, but it's just it's a tale about America and in his experiences and as he goes about and does all these things, he comes across all these other people. And so I got to play you know, 37 Americans, and uh, you know, as uh, as an American, that's something I know and I understand, and I have a deep um, affinity with these characters that I've played, but I'm almost never asked to play those in my professional life because somehow people don't think that, you know, they think I understand, you know, 
uh, the Yakuza more than I understand <laughs> the guy th that works in my deli. Um, uh, but so to have an opportunity to em embody those characters, to really kind of express the full range of who I am as uh, an American performer, and to do it in front of an audience um, who is American in, you know, in the same ways that I am, it, it really created a, an incredible uh, dialogue, you know, um, something I, I won't ever forget. Holland used to constantly say in rehearsal, it'll be completely different when I have an audience. And I used to say, well, what am I? Um, <laughs> you know, like, um, and then, of course, I got there and saw her with an audience for the first time, and I understood exactly what she meant. I mean, the audience for her was the second character for most of the show. Um, and especially, I mean, when we were in Texas, it was insane. I mean, they, they owned that, that story that there was there was laughter like i know exactly what she's talking about you know and that whole thing came about and it was astonishing to see the difference um, um but yeah i mean the audience was crucial for our show what probably makes the right it's the other half of what well i really loved so i, I love traveling a lot obviously and um I love getting the, to have the chance to see how these stories come back at me through the eyes of, of just totally different cultures, you know, whether I perform in the Middle East or I perform in Greece or I perform in England or wherever it is, um, or in New York, it's, it's a completely different experience usually. And in some ways it's, it's totally the same, but mostly in that's, that's about humor and timing. Usually timing is, is different from country to country, I'll notice, and, um, and humor. Um, everything else seems to be pretty much the same, I think. Um, <laughs> but, it, and even, um, and doing, like doing, I mostly did Blondie of Arabia, toured that a lot, and, and that people really respond to, I think just because people are, are fascinated with the other, you know, and with what, I mean, people will have, you know, a range of, of so much media about what's going on in the Middle East, and, and, and so much of it is just really bleak and really catastrophic, and I felt a lot of responsibility. I didn't, w I was very resistant to doing a show about this, because, like, well, what am I, a white girl, going to, you know, how am I going to talk about Middle Eastern culture? And I started to, like, really research Islam like crazy and, and, and like, no, no, I just have to tell my story and my experience really simply, and that's it. I can only tell that. I can't tell anything else. And, and that r really, I found that's resonated with a lot of people in different cultures, you know, around, around the world because they haven't experienced something like that. They haven't experienced that intimacy, a lot of them, with, um, you know, with cultures and with people in, in the Middle East in that way. And especially with that, with the the humor, and this play was the only play I've done the, of the three that I think is the most a comedy, um, because, and it and it really strives to show you know well don't don't hold them in, in too precious of a light and don't hold them in you know in fear either that that we're all human and we're that, that what what we really have is is this um you know the laughter and that. I had so much joy there and so much generosity come to me. It was just amazing throughout the Middle East. And um, I think that really surprises people a lot. They think that, and there were dangerous moments definitely, but I think a lot of people are just um, enthralled at, at um, seeing that intimacy and that human connection and the joy and the laughter from that. And I performed in the, the Wild Finish, the Polish play, I got produced by um, the Polish Cultural Institute to do that here, and so they brought in a lot more of, of Polish company. And most of these plays I built thinking of building them for an American audience, and um, and this play as well. Even and so sometimes I would have whole audiences that would be Polish, and um, and that was really interesting. And there's one moment in the play when um, this woman who was a, a wife of my one of the wives of my grandfather's gets up and he he forces her to sing the Polish national anthem. She was Norwegian, she didn't really know the song, <laughs> but she has to sing it to this huge group of people and she messes up and she's, she's choking on the words and this, this 
wonderful elderly Polish woman sitting in the audience starts singing the Polish national anthem <laughs> loudly so everyone can hear and then I thank her and I join in and we <laughs> sing it together <laughs> and it was just a really one and that you know that that was such a deeper connection I had with a lot of people you know Polish people that come up and that had been you know driven from their home a lot of people my grandfather could never go back and always felt that that loss, loved his homeland so much and couldn't have that again. And I think that's, that's something that always interests me, you know, is looking for the universal c question in the universe, even though I'm doing a solo show and it's largely my own story, that what, what are the universal questions, the personal and the universal, and finding that connection with people. Well, we're gonna have to end in a minute, so I just wanna ask one last question. We have a lot of writers, people who may want to write or act or direct or do all three for a solo performance. And you've heard now it could take five years to do all that stuff. So what, what advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about doing a solo performance? Don't start your solo career after you're 50 years old. <laughs> because your brain works differently than when you're young. And when you have to retain a lot of text, it's gruesome, <laughs> gruesome, gruesome. <laughs> but wisdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why she uses silence. No. Um, any? I, I, I would just repeat, uh, which is that always remember when you're working that uh, remind yourself or ask yourself what story you're telling and, and tell that story. Because so much of the time, especially if you're by yourself, you know, one of the reasons why I was so um, um, initially put off about the idea of doing a one-person show is my, you know, um, in my mind I thought of it as, well, these are, these are kind of showcase pieces, you know? People are just kind of showing off, or like, I don't want to watch one person for, you know, two hours, or, you know, all, all that kind of thing. And, the bottom line is, if you have a compelling story to tell and you're telling it well, it doesn't matter how many people are on stage. You know, people, people will want to hear it. And so I think you should just always keep in mind and keep asking yourself, what's the story? What's the story? What's the story? I'd say to, um, yeah, do it out of necessity. Don't ever approach a project or do a show to showcase or to to start your career or anything like that. It, people will know, it will read. People, every, everyone can tell everything. Um, to really have it always come from a place of necessity. When you have to tell a story, then do it. Otherwise, don't do it. There's so many solo performers <laughs> and there's so many other ways to express yourself. If you don't feel the need to do it in this format, then don't. <laughs> if that sounds harsh, I'm sorry. But, and also to follow your delight. Like that to really like, Follow even in the tragedy, you know, like Kurt Cobain said, I miss the comfort in being sad. And, and there's something also about the, maybe that doesn't apply to this at all really, but I like Kurt Cobain. But, <laughs> but that, that there's delight in the tragedy as well. And that you have to be the most interested in this and, and, and be delighted by it really. Follow the delight and follow the energy. And so it's something that you're like riding a horse through it that you just, that you also have to find the answer to that question that you posed to yourself at the beginning. That, that you really have to be driven throughout the whole thing because it's such a demanding process. And, and also to really find good collaborators to work with that, that give you that space where you feel safe to work and to try things out. Um. Uh, the two words I said to Holland on opening night were the only things at, that I could think to say to her at that point, and I just turned to her and I said, be brave, um, because there was nothing else left to say to her. That's what she needed, and, um, and uh, it was closing that she said to me, those were the best words that anyone had ever spoken to me as a director, um, and it, because it's the scariest thing in the world to be out there by yourself and not have anything behind you and and everything. So I just say, be brave. I mean, if you if you feel the need to tell the story, be brave and tell it. Yeah, I was thinking that there's a, a quote 
of Isaac Dennison I found recently, which said, all sorrows can be born if you put them in a story or tell a story about it. Yeah. Which is really nice, right? It's great. Um, that's, and that's one of the things that makes us human, mm. is, is telling a story and making, making, it's a way to make sense out of the world. And I, I want to thank our panelists here, and I want to thank... <laughs> And thank you all for coming out on such a balmy evening in New York City. Thank you. Sorry.